Hello, this is Dr. Kat Fleece again from Central New Mexico Community College. And in this Neurophysiology B video, we will focus on the various types of ion channels. In muscle physiology, you were already introduced to uh, chemically gated ion channels or ligand gated channels, um, or just ligand channels, I should say, as well as voltage gated channels. And you may have already been introduced to leakage channels. We're going to make more sense out of some of these channels and add some more. So there are many different ion channels in the body. You've only seen or been introduced to a few, but most of them can be put into two big categories. And really I should add a third category here. So I'm going to do that right off the bat so that um, you're aware of these. The, so we have our first group here called the gated or active channels, the leakage or passive channels, and I'm going to add a third group, and those are your ion pumps. All right. So I'm going to start backwards. <laughs> and for the pumps, you are quite familiar with the sodium potassium pumps. And there are also calcium pumps and more, all right? Um, so there aren't just sodium potassium pumps. You have a variety of ion pumps. And the important part to remember here is that ions move against their concentration gradient. Or up their concentration gradient or um, yeah, I think those are two ways of expressing that. So if we quickly review ion concentrations, here they come again. Remember that we always have a lot more sodium on the outside of any cell compared to the inside. You need to know these ion concentration gradients off the top of your head. We have a lot more calcium, um, I'm so sorry, potassium on the inside compared to the outside. If we look at calcium, we have a lot more calcium on the outside, two positive charges for calcium, don't forget, uh, compared to the inside. And then we'll also add one more, and that is chloride, which is a negatively charged ion. And it's chloride, not chlorine, it's chloride. Chlorine is the element. The charged particle of chlorine is called chloride. And so we have less chlorine on the inside. And so, um, when we say that ions move against their concentration gradient for sodium, that would mean that it's moving from the inside up against its gradient towards the outside. It's as if we're trying to move water across a dam from where there is less water to where there is much more water, right? And all of these ion pumps always, therefore, require ATP. And so ATP must be hydrolyzed into ADP plus PI, and I'm sorry, I'm running out of um, space here, and energy. And it's this energy that allows for ions to be moved against their concentration gradient, right? You've already seen that there are calcium pumps present in both the axonal terminal of, of um, neurons and also in the, the membranes of the terminal cisterni of our uh, skeletal muscle cells. So those are examples of calcium pumps. And like I said, there are other ion pumps. So that's your third category. Your second category of ion channels, I have re been referring to already as leakage channels. I do not care to use the terms passive and active in my discussion here. These terms passive and active, heads up, these terms active and passive have nothing to do with concentration gradients, all right? Nothing. So a leakage channel is a channel that opens randomly or it's open all the time. It doesn't need any stimulus to open right? It might just be open all the time and ions literally just leak through it uh, 
um, along their concentration gradient as well as um, along their electrical gradient, meaning that they'll move to where uh, there is um, where there is their opposite charge, right? Or uh, some leakage channels sort of open, close, open, close, open, close, but they, they don't really need any kind of a trigger to do that. So those we call leakage channels. Um, and then your gated channels, they will only open in response to a stimulus. So let me highlight that here for you. So they only open in response to a stimulus. They must have some kind of a stimulus. For instance, the binding of a neurotransmitter, right? That would be a chemical stimulus or um, a drastic change in the voltage of the membrane. That would be a voltage stimulus or light hitting my um, receptor cells in my eyes. That would be a stimulus, a light stimulus, or sound hitting the hearing receptors in my ear, that would be a, a sound uh, stimulus, or um, a bug landing on my arm. Now, some of my touch receptors, perhaps my Meissner's corpuscles, are going to be um, stimulated, um, and so on and so on. There are many kinds of receptors. There are pressure receptors, um, uh, receptors in your stomach that detect changes in the pH and on and on and on. Okay, so I haven't list. I do. I do not have. Let me take a look here. I've listed almost all of the different types of ion channels here, but but maybe not everything. Mechanically gated channels are going to include um, um, touch receptors. Um, let's put it that way. All right, so they all have a little gate inside of them, a little door that will only open if they receive a specific um, trigger, a particular stimulus. Now, neither one of the first two categories, so I uh, will write this in red, category one and category two, they are allowing ions to move along their concentration gradient. Therefore, they do not require the energy from ATP hydrolysis. So no ATP hydrolysis required. I'm going to abbreviate required. On the other hand, Allow me to remind you, um, ion pumps, on the other hand, they do depend on the energy released by means of ATP hydrolysis. Please understand now why I don't particularly care to refer to gated channels as active channels and leakage channels or passive channels. These terms have nothing to do with ions moving against or along their, their concentration gradients, right? So all of these channels listed here, when they open, ions just move down their concentration gradient as if they're moving from, um, you know, the area where there's tons of uh, particles on, on one side of the dam to the other side of the dam where there's hardly any. Very important for you to keep that in mind. Do not let you yourself be distracted by these terms. I do not care for them. I don't like to use them. I will use the terms gated channels and leakage channels and ion pumps instead. Now we do need to say just a few more words about all of these ion channels because some of them are going to be really selective and some of them may, may not be very selective at all. And it all depends on you know, their, their chemistry. And remember these ion channels, what are they made up of? All of these ion channels are made are proteins made up of a bunch of amino acids, right? Ion channels are proteins. Don't forget that. Ion channels are proteins that are coded for by the genes in your DNA. So all of these ion channels are proteins. Proteins are made up of a certain sequence of amino acids. And you may recall that amino acids, not only can they be arranged in a certain way to create, you know, a certain protein, but some of them really like water and some of them are like 
not wanting to have anything to do with water. So there's some, some of them are hydrophilic, others are hydrophobic, and that's um, going to impact what kinds of ions can pass through them. Some of them are going to be very uh, charge specific and yet not size specific, right? So there's all of these different types of ion channels and that's going to dictate which ion channels can, which ions can pass through with which charges, with what size, um, and so on. All right. Um, now, if we for a moment focus on gated ion channels, remember they need a trigger, they need a stimulus. One of the ones that we really already discussed a lot is our chemically gated ion channels or our ligand gated channels. Um, we studied them in the neuromuscular junction. And what, what these um, chemically gated ion channels look like is, you know, they sit in the, the cell membrane. And the moment a chemical binds to them, they're going to change shape. You know, that's what proteins do, by the way. Anytime something binds to a protein, it's going to go... It's going to change its shape, right? Most proteins you've learned about um, in the body are, are this three-dimensional structure. They're tertiary proteins. Um, you know, your, your enzymes, your antibodies, ion channels, they're like these globe-like or, or spherish-like types of proteins. And anytime something binds to them, they're going to see a bit of a shift in all of the bonds that hold the peptides chains together. And so, for instance, in the skeletal muscle neuromuscular junction, when acetylcholine binds to um, the receptor site of the ion channel, which is a protein, it's going to change shape. And next thing we know, uh, there's a little tunnel and ions that can actually pass through because of their charge or their size, whether they're hydrophilic or hydrophobic, all that stuff um, are now going to be able to follow their concentration gradient. In the case of acetylcholine binding to its acetylcholine receptors in skeletal muscle, we're going to see that both sodium and potassium pass through at the same time, following their concentration gradient. Now, here we see that calcium is also mentioned um, because this can happen at times in other locations of the body that calcium uh, passes through this kind of a receptor as well. It more than likely will require a different neurotransmitter. Even chloride will be able to pass through a gated channel, assuming we have a, a type of neurotransmitter that would impact um, ion channels. Here we see an example of a mechanically gated channel and thermoreceptors, which I forgot to mention earlier, which are receptive to changes in temperature work, work similarly. So in this example here, we see the little gate here, the little door that needs to be triggered to open. So for instance, a mechanical stimulus such as a touch or perhaps pressure could potentially open the little gate and now we see that our ions can flow along their concentration gradient. Notice the error here, by the way. Um, this should say potassium rather than calcium. Another ion channel that we've discussed a lot already uh, in muscle physiology is um, the voltage-gated ion channel. So in this case, the stimulus is a a significant change in the resting membrane potential. We're going to discuss the rest, resting membrane potential in much more depth in neurophysiology so that you get a good grasp of exactly what it is. Um, but for now, remember that the inside of a cell membrane is going to always be more negative when we compare it to the outside of the cell membrane. It doesn't mean that the inside only has negative ions and the outside only has positive ions. Um, it's just that when we compare the number of negative and positive charges on the inside with the outside, there tend to be more negative ones close to the inside compared to on the outside. Um, and so here on the left-hand side, we see that a cell, for instance, in this case, a neuron is at rest. 
uh, we're going to see that the resting membrane potential of, of neurons is typically around minus 70. It really can vary, but let's just use that as our, our um, average resting membrane potential when there is now a depolarization change of about 15 to 20 millivolts, as we see here, that triggers the opening of our little lock here, our little door that opens up so that ions can flow through. And finally, there are leakage channels that are either open all the time or they open at random and allow for ions to move um, through them again along their concentration gradient. So this wraps up our discussion of ion channels. Again, there are all kinds of ion channels. Keep that in mind, in your ears, in your eyes, in the lining of your stomach, on and on and on. Um, and so this is a pretty important discussion we just had because when you move into anatomy and physiology two, uh, taking pathophysiology one or two, you're going to be con continually reminded of all these various proteins that sit in the cell membranes of our cells and they function as ion channels. Um, just to apply some of the information that you're learning to uh, the real world that that you all will be dealing with, particularly if you're going to become, I would say, respiratory therapists and, and nurses and physician assistants and pharmacists, for instance, you will be dealing with medications that will impact a lot of these ion channels. They will either be medications that keep the ion channels open or trigger them to open more often, or many medications will make it harder for the ion channels to open up. And this, these are all kinds of medications that, for instance, can reduce muscle contractions, increase muscle contractions, reduce your heart rate, increase your heart rate, make your blood vessels constrict more, increasing peripheral resistance that increases blood pressure or reducing the blood pressure, um, um, causing your the, the bladder to contract less so that there's less leakage. As we age, we tend to lose, you know, the, the bladder, the smooth muscle of our bladder is not as good at, as, or I should say the sphincter part of our sphincter muscles in our bladder are not as good at staying contracted so that we can hold our urine as we get older. And so the medications can be prescribed to make that sphincter work a little bit better and on and on and on. These ion channels play an incredibly important role in medications. So keep that in mind.